Hello and welcome everyone to the webinar on underwater noise uh, organized by the Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, this was a uh, this was a webinar. It's a very important webinar for us in the CBD as it will launch our new technical series report on on, on the impacts of of anthropogenic underwater noise and approaches to mitigate those impacts. Um, this will be uh, an important opportunity not only for us to launch this report, which actually has become available on our website just this morning, but also to hear a bit more about what is happening across the uh, across the intergovernmental landscape, across the across the landscape of global and regional organizations that are looking at underwater noise um, and doing so perhaps from some different angles, depending on perhaps the, the species or the types of animals or or the or the actual activities that were that are that are you know creating or um, having underwater noise uh, implications. So we have a very uh, great panel before us of of, uh, of colleagues across different different intergovernmental institutions who will give us updates on their work. Uh, and and this all really is is an important part of of where our new report fits into. Um, we in the CBD, uh, as as you as you uh, can can imagine, look at the issues related to conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. But for those impacts and for those issues to be robustly addressed, it's important for other institutions across different sectors, across different uh, levels and scales, to actually you know to, for us to work together with them to to to, to bring these actions and and bring these uh, implementation scenarios into into reality. So, uh, with that, I will start um, sharing my screen and, and, and showing the presentation to give a little bit of a of a background on on where this uh, where this work comes from and how we arrived to this uh, to this report. Um, bear with me just one second. And I, sh I should also I, I neglected to introduce myself. I think I see some familiar faces on the on the on the on the list here. But my name is Joe Appiah. I, I coordinate the work on marine, coastal, and island biodiversity under the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And in that capacity, have coordinated um, this work on anthropogenic underwater noise. Now, for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with the Convention on Biological Diversity or the CBD, it is a intergovernmental, uh, international convention that was uh, entered into force in 1993. We presently have 196 parties, so near universal participation. And we have three main goals, which is the conservation of biological diversity and the sustainable use of biodiversity, as well as the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from the use of genetic resources. So in that capacity, um, our parties collectively make decisions about how to implement the convention through the conference of the parties or the COP. Uh, and we in the Secretariat not only support that decision-making process, but also support parties in implementing those decisions and, the, uh, and, and actually bringing those, uh, helping as, as much as we can to bring those decisions to reality. Now, in, in the context of the work on marine and coastal biodiversity, this actually entails a, a wide range of different activities. So, in fact, uh, we're, we're a bit more, I would say, generalists rather than specialists. We, 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 we spread our wings across a wide range of different topics. Uh, this includes um, work on understanding the value of marine and coastal ecosystems and our work on, on EBSIS or ecologically or biologically significant marine areas is a really important part of that. Um, understanding and mitigating pressures on values of marine and coastal ecosystems. Um, the work on underwater noise is one part of that. We've also looked at issues such as marine debris and ocean acidification in recent years. We also have a, a portfolio of work focused more on the planning and management approaches, which includes things like marine spatial planning, uh, protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures, uh, biodiversity mainstreaming um, um, in different sectors, and uh, we coordinate various types of work focused on building capacity and catalyzing partnerships for implementation. And we largely do that through our uh, through the Sustainable Ocean Initiative, uh, which we coordinate in the Secretariat together with a wide range of partners. But looking more closely into the issue of anthropogenic underwater noise, uh, this is something that actually has been uh, quite a prominent topic of discussion by the Conference of the Parties, spanning all the way back to 2010. Uh, and 2010, actually, at COP10 was was an important an important COP for for the CBD because it was 
uh, the COP where the Aichi biodiversity targets were adopted, and many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with those. But alongside the adoption of those targets, the parties um, the parties articulated what types of um, what types of specific thematic issues would be essential to achieving uh, and to implementing and achieving um, the Aichi targets. And underwater noise was one of those impacts, uh, was one of those issues. Um, so at COP10, the uh, at, at the tenth meeting of the COP, the COP requested information on the impacts of underwater noise. So this was uh, for the CBD at least was a was a new topic. Um, of course, it had been in, in in some discussions, and the implications of it had been in discussions uh, for 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 years before. But this was the first time it was really raised formally in the CBD. And in response to that we produced a scientific synthesis on those impacts. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe one of my other colleagues, Simon Harding, was involved in that. Actually, this this was before my time at the CBD, so and we have some even deeper institutional, hist institutional historical knowledge here on the call, even more so than myself. But at the 11th meeting of the Conference of the Parties, uh, the scientific synthesis was uh, presented and that COP actually requested an expert workshop to look more deeply at the issue of underwater noise. So in 2014, uh, we coordinated a CBD expert workshop on underwater noise and its impacts on marine and coastal biodiversity. Uh, this was uh, supported by the European Union and was uh, hosted at the International Maritime Organization in London. So we have our IMO colleague on the call that we can also thank for that, uh, for that hosting. Um, this meeting was, again, really kind of the, the first focused technical discussion in the context of the CBD on the issue of underwater noise. Um, we had representatives and experts from across the global landscape from representing parties all over the world, as well as uh, NGOs and some from the industry as well. It looked at issues such as major sources and trends and the prevalence and magnitude of noise, uh, impacts on biodiversity, knowledge gaps, <clears throat> the importance of promoting research and awareness, uh, to improve our understanding of these impacts and potential measures to minimize uh, significant adverse impacts and um, best management practices. Now, the outcomes of this meeting were provided to the 12th meeting of the Conference of the Parties, COP12. And in that decision, the COP actually specified specific measures that the COP saw as important to addressing this topic and which it encouraged all parties to actually implement and, and, and do. Now, this included a range of different measures, and all, and, and all of these were in, in, in emerging and based on the outcomes of the expert workshop. And these include, and I'm not going to read all of these uh, in detail, but these include actions such as you know, defining and differentiating different types and intensities of underwater noise, the need for further research on the uh, knowledge gaps, developing and transferring more quieting technologies, um, combining acoustic mapping with habitat mapping, uh, conducting impact assessments where appropriate, uh, utilizing area-based management tools to address underwater noise where appropriate, um, and building capacity. <coughs> Apologies if I sound raspy. Uh, actually, my, my wife and I were just diagnosed with COVID yesterday, so uh, uh, actually my, my, the raspiness of my voice is, uh, will, will perhaps uh, create some unwanted noise in this call, unfortunately. Uh, so. The 12th meeting of the Conference of the Parties outlined these measures and requested the Secretariat to, requested of course the, the parties to actually implement these measures, but then also requested the Secretariat to continue to um, assess how parties were doing in implementing these measures. So, so every, every, uh, every COP we would continue to basically request the governments to tell us what they're doing to address underwater noise, to give us updates on their their research efforts, their management efforts, their mitigation efforts, and we periodically then came back to uh, to um, to the COP to let them know what was happening and how things were going. Now, all of and and the types of measures that we heard in response to these to these requests were things like monitoring of sound sensitive species, um, permitting requirements to include assessment of potential impacts uh, on underwater noise and the use of noise mitigation tools and practices. Um, restricting development projects near especially biodiverse and sensitive marine sites, and providing financial incentives for installing certain types of quieting technologies. But we did also see that this was a, an issue that was, um, there was quite a lot of disparity in terms of, uh, let's say, how, how where, where things were actually being done and, and the capacities that are in place 
in in different parties to actually address the issue of underwater noise. So we we did see that there was quite a lot of the need for greater um, awareness building and capacity building to to enable all parties to uh, actually adequately address this topic. Importantly, this also fed into the issue and is really an important component of the issue of, of mainstreaming biodiversity. So um, some of you have, may have heard this, uh, this term before, biodiversity mainstreaming, and really what this speaks to is the process of embedding biodiversity considerations into the policies, strategies, and practices of key public and private actors. Um, so this, this, this topic of, of ensuring that different sectors and uses of, of, the, of, of the natural environment and the marine environment integrate considerations of biodiversity, uh, both impacts, uh, negative impacts of biodiversity, as, as well as in some cases, positive implications for biodiversity. <clears throat> so if we look at the different sectors that were addressed here at COP13 and COP14 in particular, we can see that actually uh, noise is, is, you know, a number of these sectors do have uh, implications for, for underwater noise. So um, all of this work and all of this, this work about the, the experiences that we were hearing from parties, um, the, the lessons that, that were being learned and, and how things were moving along, synthesized into this new report that we're launching today, which is CBD Technical Series Report number 99, Review of the Impacts of Anthropogenic Underwater Noise and Marine and Biodiversity and Approaches to Manage and Mitigate These Impacts. This was produced with financial support from the European Union, which we're very grateful for. And is now, as of uh, as of 8 a.m. this morning in Montreal time, is available on our CBD website. So please uh, go to the website. Um, <clears throat> you can find it by using this URL um, or navigating through the website through the publications page. We will also be disseminating this uh, this URL to all registered participants. So now um, I'm going to turn to the co-authors of this report to give us a little bit more background. On, uh, on how the report developed. Actually, the development of, of, this, of this report was, uh, was, was kind of a, a long undertaking uh, that, that, that kind of emerged and, and evolved in different ways and, and, and until arriving at its final form. So we're gonna hear from our, our, our colleagues, Simon Harding and, and Neil Cousins to give us an update, the actual, the co-authors of this report to give us an overview of, uh, of, of the development of the report and the report's contents. So with that, I will pass to uh, to Simon and Neil. Okay, thank you, Joe. So I'm going to talk about the development of the, the report, um, then hand over to, to Neil to give a, a PowerPoint presentation about it. Um, so I first started working on a version of this report back in the autumn of 2011, so it's great to see this work is now published as a, as a CBD technical series document. The first version focused mainly on the impacts of underwater noise and marine biodiversity and was completed in early 2012. Um, it was also important to explain how sound behaves underwater as opposed to in air and to explain the importance of sound to fauna in the marine soundscape. At the time, most of the research had been con conducted on marine mammals, especially cetaceans, with some work on bony fishes, but very little on other taxes such as elasmobranchs, marine turtles, especially invertebrates. The work summarized in the first report was presented at two side events in 2012, at the Sub-16 uh, meeting in Montreal, and later on at COP11 in Hyderabad in October of that year. Uh, this first impact report was then updated a little in late 2013, early 2014, prior to the CBD expert workshop held in London at the IMO in February 2014. Uh, a second report was also written for that workshop uh, that focused on guidance and toolkits for the mitigation and management of underwater noise. Um, after some initial work to develop the first synthesis report into a technical series review in 2015, it was decided to combine both documents into one more comprehensive uh, synthesis uh, in 2018, whilst also updating the content for new research findings and mitigation approaches. This new version was reviewed by a few selected experts in 2019, who greatly helped to develop the sections for marine fishes and incorporate better thinking around particle motion. 
The new version was then shared widely in an open peer review process in September 2020. This peer review resulted in a very extensive set of comments that, um, when put it as a table, stretched to 170 pages of uh, comments. Uh, my colleague Neil then took on the task to incorporate all of these comments into uh, a new draft technical series uh, synthesis and also revised the document and further updated it with new information. Uh, the report has considerably evolved over the last decade to incorporate new knowledge and also summarise current best practice for noise management and mitigation. I'll now hand over to Neil um, to provide an outline of the report and its content along with key messages from the synthesis. Over to you Neil, thanks. Okay, thank you, Simon. Hello, everybody. Um, so, so Joe has um, given an outline of the the aims and um, scope of this piece of work, and obviously Simon has just followed that up with with an evolution. My my involvement is relatively recent, as as Simon has mentioned, getting involved on the update since the the um, draft iteration that was um, distributed about a year ago. Um, so it's an honor to to be able to introduce the the report to you um, today. There's obviously been a huge amount of work that's been carried out to to deliver it and and as um, as Joe has mentioned it it is considered quite an important piece for the CBD so so it's great that it's out there. Um, my role today is just to give you a, a, an overview. I think we have a, a varied audience uh, on the webinar today. So, so this will be a non-technical overview of, of the contents of the report and some of the key messages. I think the thing to say is that this is a technical review report. It is a technical document. It deals with um, scientific research and, and scientific um, issues. So um, the report is is um, dealing with a complex issue, but we try to make it as accessible as possible to to a range of audiences. Um, and um, yeah, again today we'll we'll try and keep it as light in terms of scientific detail as, as possible. The report is um, organised into five key areas. Um, um, to begin with, we introduce um, the characteristics of underwater sound from, from a perspective of um, natural sound and also anthropogenic um, sound that may um, have an influence on receptors in the marine environment. Um, then we talk about the different types of sources of, of sound, um, the intensity of anthropogenic underwater sound. Um, and, and also um, the, the the potential uh, responses of marine wildlife to to those sources. We then review the the impacts of, of sound on a range of marine taxa. Um, so not focused on one particular area. We've tried to cover all all marine wildlife groups as as far as we can, as far as the literature allows us to do. Um, and we also cover um, the approaches to to mitigate and, and manage those impacts um, and, and do an analysis of the the coverage and breadth of of that particular of, of, of those measures to deal with this particular issue. Um, the last area we, we deal with future research needs. So try to we try to identify the gaps in knowledge and, and what else needs to be to be done. I guess in terms of thinking about uncertainties, this is a, a, a strand, um, a string um, that threads right through the documents actually when we're trying to um, understand um, the balance in terms of the research and what is known and, and what isn't known. Next slide, please. Okay, I think straight up, um, it's you know it's really important to say that this this report has not been produced in a vacuum. Um, as Simon has mentioned, it's evolved, uh, and Joe's mentioned, sorry, it's evolved since um, 2010 with various iterations and different focus for, for the report over that time period. Um, and there's been a huge amount of work that's been carried out for, for underwater sound issues over, over many decades. Um, and reviews in terms of the effects um, of underwater sound on, on marine wildlife are, are, are many um, and, and detailed. Um, and we have covered those, those pieces of work, given them exposure, and of course, drawn out some of the key conclusions within, within those pieces of work. 
Some of that work, such as the Oxbar review, predates um, the development of this particular report. Um, some of it has been developed whilst the report has evolved, and some of it has been developed since um, that process was, was was completed a couple of years ago in, in terms of the, the first draft that was submitted. Um, so as you can imagine, as the report has taken, taken developments over these steps, more information keeps flowing in, and the report has had to, to respond to, to to address those issues. But just to say that there is th this report um, is important, but there's a lot of other research developed by other um, scientists and international bodies that have been developed that, that also provide an incredibly useful resource to understand these particular issues. Next slide, please. Okay, so that said, um, obviously to produce a report like this, it, it needs to be, it needs to have some added volume. We believe it, it really does. Um, my opinion is that it could potentially be seen as a go-to resource um, for industry um, consultants, practitioners who are assessing potential impacts and trying to mitigate them conservationists and decision makers and, and CBD CBD parties. Um, just from my experience as a, as a co-author even, um, I'm continuously referring back to this report um, when I'm dealing with a, a project issue to, to um, trigger um, where I can find research or to trigger where a question has been answered or, or to, to um, um, think about a particular issue in a certain geography and to drill down a little in terms of the issues. I think, you know, this report doesn't provide a critique, it doesn't provide all of the information, but certainly what it does provide is a roadmap for that information. Um, and I think a, an incredibly valuable resource in, on, on that basis um, and, um, and that's something I think that many of you will find very useful to use in your in your day-to-day -day working and decision-making processes. The aim of the, of the report is essentially to provide a state of knowledge review. Um, I would say it's a collation of information. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's not a critique. We're not trying to prove anything with this particular piece of work. There's no primary analysis included within it. It's not a synthesis in terms of trying to form conclusions of, um, of certain hypotheses in terms of what the, the the, the information out there is trying to to cover and say um, it is really a repository, and I think it you know I think in itself that's an incredibly useful um, thing to have. Um, like other guidelines, such as the CMS Family Guidelines, it does um, consider all potentially sensitive marine taxa in one place, which is useful. Um, of course, um, there are various there's various different reviews that have focused upon uh, fishes, for example, fishes and invertebrates, which are incredibly useful, incredibly technical, and, 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 and we point you in the right direction to review those pieces of work, but also um, to have everything in one area where you can um, review information um, across multiple receptors for a particular project, for instance, it will be very useful. Um, in contrast to some other reviews, we've tried to collate the impact and mitigation into one one area, into one report, um, which um, hasn't been done consistently, I would say, across the other guides. Some guides do this, or some papers do this, but other guides in general don't. Um, and, and the reason the report has done this is because, as Joe and Simon have mentioned, it's been developed in two parts, which have been pulled together as one, one particular report. And I, I think that was a, a very wise decision to do that, again, because it create a single resource to use. Um, the report sets out, tries to set out at least what we know, um, and it tries to do that in a, in a balanced way, um, so that if we are talking about research, we, we have considered what level of um, certainty is, is attached to that piece of work, or if we are considering um, mitigation practices, what the certainty of evidence is and the uh, effectiveness of that mitigation. Um, so we, we've tried to do that as far as possible, um, mostly to inform the understanding of gaps and, and future research needs. Obviously, the key, the primary intent, as Joe mentioned, is, is for the report to provide a basis for CBD parties to understand the importance of this issue for, for ocean health, 
um, and obviously connected to that, um, the, the health and well-being of, of people. Um, um, so, you know, this is, it, it, it just builds upon what's been done before to, to state how important an issue this is. Um, and the report demonstrates a need for continued and expanded collaboration and research, even with decades of research uncertainties remain. Um, and that's due to complexity, that's due to um, issues associated with understanding responses of, of, um, of, um, of marine wildlife, but also the variables that influence um, uh, um, uh, how un anthropogenic underwater sound affects marine wildlife. Um, but there is certainly a need um, for, for more to be done to try and improve the understanding and also to understand how to respond to this particular issue. Next slide, please. Okay, so as I said, this is a very light, non-technical overview um, of some of the things that the report talks about. Um, it's a, it's a long report. I think you saw the content earlier, to, you know, over 140 pages. So um, there's a lot of information in it. Um, so these are really just, just top level highlights. Um, so the report talks about um, how the marine environment is filled with different sounds from natural and human sources and talks about those. It talks about the, the, the importance of natural sound for a range of functions for marine wildlife in terms of their reception, but also their use of sound um, for, 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 their, um, for their functions. Um, we talk about the different components of sound being sound pressure and particle motion. Particle motion is something that's been, been given an ever increasing um, attention in, in recent years, particularly associated with impacts um, for, for fish and, and invertebrates. Um, so we, we, we talk about that issue and also talk about um, some of the gaps that relate to, to understanding this particular issue. What's clear is that the soundscape is changing particularly in some areas where you have um, cumulative effects and um, in combination sound sources within, within particular areas. Um, and in, within those areas, obviously the soundscape has been significantly altered by humans um, over the last hundred years with inevitable consequences, like there are on land. You know, if you have, if you lead to change, then there's, there's a clear um, consequence of, of that particular change. And the key is understanding what that consequence is. Um, this is not a new issue of concern. It's been an issue of concern for, for a long time. Um, and there's a lot of research that's been devoted to, to understand the issue. And that's ever increasing. I think even since we've developed this particular report, there will be another 50 papers that are being um, produced to, to address the issue. So it's, um, it's a long-term concern, long-term area of research, but the pace is, is still fast in terms of learning more. Um, and with all of that data, as I've mentioned earlier, there are still gaps, um, particularly for certain taxonomic groups. There are gaps, but also understanding the effectiveness of mitigation. There are gaps. Um, so, so those gaps need to be addressed to really, to really begin to, to manage this issue for, for the marine environment effectively. Next slide, please. So what kind of effects does underwater noise um, create? Well, it, it can create direct effects across a range of different taxa, um, and they can be physical, physiological, perceptual, and behavioral. Um, most research is, um, un uh, helps to understand those in initial components better than behavioral impacts, indirect effects, and cumulative effects. I think these, these are a little bit more difficult to understand potentially, but also uh, and more complex, um, and, um, but, but important. Um, and you, you find that a lot of the, um, particularly from an assessment perspective, a lot of the attention of, of the impact assessments or mitigation relates to physical impacts or, or harm, whereas the other issues associated with behavioral impacts in direct effects and cumulative effects probably have a greater consequence all, all told or potentially have a greater on, con, uh, consequence all told. So we, we draw out those sorts of issues. Um, it's complex, you know, the, how marine no, underwater noise affects receptors. Is, is dependent on um, a number of different um, contexts. It's context specific. Um, so it's not a, um, 
it's not kind of a broad brush consideration. You you can understand in generality generality what the issues are, but but it's complex and very often site specific. In general, higher intensity sound and long term chronic exposure it could be considered of higher risk. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody, um, but that's the case. Um, to help address these issues, a lot of research has been placed into understanding exposure and criteria being developed. But one thing to say about that, it relates to sound pressure, not particle motion, um, and the level of certainty for is greater for marine mammals, but even then it's estimated in many instances and modeled and um, because of the morality of doing tests to cause injury in the real in the real world, etc. And there are gaps for you know many of the taxonomic groups that can be sensitive to marine sound in, in the marine environment. So these these are issues that need need to be considered. Also they're just guidance because um, they're not it's not they're not rules um, and sometimes these exposure criteria are are taken as um, as rules um, and um, and they're, they're not meant to be that they're meant to be guidance to indicate where a potential issue may occur. Um, most studies have over the years have focused on marine mammals, especially cetaceans, but there is an ever increasing level of knowledge being generated for for other groups such as fishes, sea turtles, uh, invertebrates, etc. Invertebrates certainly getting a lot more attention in recent years, but for many of these taxonomic groups, there there are huge gaps in terms of knowledge and, and understanding of effects and and how to how to manage them effectively. Um, Particle motion is another area which um, needs more attention generally, um, particularly related to, to managing impacts um, and, and the mitigation that is developed to, to deal with sound issues. Um, last slide. Thank you. Okay, um, and then many of the studies are, are in controlled um, environments, there's good reasons for that. Obviously, um, exposing animals to sound in the real world has its uh, has its difficulties, um, um, and and therefore um, much of the research is related to kind of artificial environments in some ways. Although that research tries to deal with those issues as best it, it can, um, but there is a need for consideration of of issues uh, better understanding of issues in, in the real world, in the real environment, particularly for mitigation, I would say that particularly for mitigation effectiveness and how that is applied um, and how appropriate it is. Um, there's a need to consider population effects in more detail, the cumulative impacts I've already mentioned, need, need more um, kind of um, broader scale approaches. Um, to, to understand, and there are programs that um, develop or have been developed to look into cumulative issues that provide some sort of example and template, such as the ECHO program in Vancouver, as an example. Um, and there's a lot of mitigation uh, measures that have been developed for different sound sources, whether they be impulsive or non-impulsive, and they're widely applied. Um, but again, they can be limited. Mostly, they focus on the potential for harm. Um, they may be useful for um, addressing behavioral impacts, but not always. Um, and, um, and as I mentioned earlier, they may not necessarily address cumulative effects um, or, or seek to address cumulative effects. So these are these specific, specific gaps that we try to outline. Um, there's a huge range of guidance that's been developed for for um, mitigating um, the impacts of sound, whether that's um, the great Russells uh, on, on the on the panel today, the great work for for vessel um, vessel noise or um, related to um, um, explosives, and and there's a whole range of um, guidance across many countries that seeks to deal with those particular issues. But again. They can be limited in terms of, of their focus um, and not necessarily appropriate for all of the groups that may be affected by, by noise. Um, and this needs more assessment. So the appropriateness of some of the mitigation needs more assessment and, um, and also the application of precautionary principle, et cetera, needs more consideration with scientific robustness behind it, et cetera. So we, we touch, touch upon those issues. And then, and then finally, the, the report deals with the, a range of management frameworks, agreements, and processes that have been developed by other 
bodies, non-governmental bodies, to, to try and address those issues. And I believe um, some of the other members of the panel will be introducing some of that work as, as, as we go forward. Um, so there ends my presentation. Simon, you, you want to, I think I'm passing over to you for some, for some concluding remarks. Yeah, um, thanks, Neil. Uh, I'll keep this brief because uh, I think most things have already been covered in the presentation. Um, but uh, well, we both feel it's a very useful resource, and um, we hope it's, hope it's used as much as possible. I mean, it took a lot of time to to develop and, and finalise. Um, um, just one further um, uh, personal point. I, I, I think it would be good if there's chance to develop further products from this report um, such as a, a summary for policymakers or a toolkit on breast practice with links to existing initiatives um, but we'll see on that and see what happens in the future of that um, so um, I'll pass now back to, to Joe for the for the next uh, section of the webinar Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for that overview. Um, and I think that really kind of captured the the uh, the nature of the document, how it evolved, and what it intends to do. Um, as as Simon and Neil articulated, it is uh, a synthesis of what's already out there. So in fact, it's it's not intended to produce. If it's not producing new research or, or new new findings, what it is intended to do is to be somewhat of a one-stop shop for for up for uh, the relevant up-to-date information on underwater noise in the context of marine biodiversity and looking at it both from the impact perspective as well as approaches to minimize and mitigate these impacts. Uh, so in that in that respect, it actually builds on and, and, and brings together a lot of the work that's been done across the field and across many of the, 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 the organizations and processes that are represented here in our webinar. So we have uh, our colleagues here to thank as well for actually doing much of the hard, uh, more technical work that, that we uh, benefit from in, in bringing this all together. And we also have to thank the many, many parties who have provided input to this, many governments and organizations and stakeholders, because actually it, the, 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 pro, the, the report as it's evolved has built on the submissions that we've requested from governments and organizations and stakeholders to tell us what they're doing, what kind of research is happening. And the report itself actually, um, was was posted for public comment and we received a lot of input to it so uh so thanks not only to you know to the to the to, to, to those who are here and many other uh organizations and entities that are doing this work but in fact to our parties and many of you on the call i see some on the call who have actually submitted input so thanks to all of you and and, and all of you for helping to make uh, to build this body of work that the report hopefully provides an overview of so now we we have uh, we have a really interesting uh, panel here, as I said, focusing on on developments and processes and work uh, from the intergovernmental perspective. And we have uh, both a number of global organizations, uh, intergovernmental organizations, and regional intergovernmental organizations uh, represented here to tell us about their work. And and these uh, these organizations look at the issue of underwater noise through different lenses, um, you know, through migratory species or shipping. Um, but it's important to, to sort of see what's happening across the landscape so we can understand not only um, the research and work that's being done, the goals and priorities that are being articulated, but what governments, industry, and stakeholders need to do to actually make this real on the ground. So now uh, we turn to our colleague Hydrun Frisch Nakwanma from the Convention on Migratory Species, who's going to give us an update on, on the work under CMS on this important topic. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, and uh, thank you really for the opportunity to present here today. Uh, congratulations, really, on on the launch of your technical series. That's going to be um, a very uh, helpful document, I'm sure, and we'll be happy to promote that to our parties as well. So, yeah, my name is Heidrun Frischwakama. I'm um, a program officer in the Secretariat of the Convention on Migratory Species and, um, amongst other things, the lead on the topic of underwater noise. So just as very brief background on CMS, um, as we call ourselves for short, it's also an MEA, so similar to CBD. Um, on the right-hand side, you see a map of our parties. So the dark blue ones are CMS parties, currently 133. 
and it's a very specialized treaty. We are um, focusing on the conservation of migratory species and their habitats, um, but that includes, I mean, marine and, and freshwater species, uh, avian species and terrestrial species. Uh, CMS also acts as a framework convention and there are seven legally binding agreements uh, that have been concluded in that framework and 19 memoranda of understanding. Quite a few of those are also um, on marine species and they cover different taxonomic groups in different regions. So yes, CMS and marine noise. So uh, discussions actually within CMS already started in 2005 and we had the first mention of underwater noise as an issue um, at COP8 in that same year where it was recognized as something important to look into. And then in 2008, we had the first dedicated resolution just focusing on this. And um, as was already mentioned in relation to the report, um, the largest body of evidence uh, is really related to cetaceans. Um, so this was also the main focus of that resolution, but it already acknowledged that other marine species might be affected as well. And since then, really, this has been a steady topic, um, increasing in importance um, quite a bit, uh, and we've worked on that a lot. Um, some of the concerns were outlined, so I won't go into this in more detail, but really underwater sound can, apart from sort of directly killing, which of course is the extreme case, have a wide range of negative impacts on marine species. And we've increasingly seen more evidence come forward, as also um, outlined in the previous presentation, um, that it's really not only the big iconic species being affected, I mean, and they most certainly are, but that this affects like all parts of the marine ecosystem in the end. And um, so it's migratory species is their prey, but also even the very basis um, of marine ecosystems um, can be affected. And we're, as we're learning more and more about that, the type of guidance CBD and CMS and others are um, providing to countries to address this is really crucial. So the resolution we currently have in place is resolution 12.14, adopted in 2017. And it very specifically deals not only with CMS listed marine species, which will be like the big iconic species um, most of us will be very familiar with, but also their prey. So our parties are really trying to address this in a more holistic way. Uh, manner. It also importantly reaffirms the precautionary principle um, and it's very focused on what can be done practically. Um, so in its annex that resolution contains the CMS family guidelines on environmental impact assessment for noise generating activities. They were also already mentioned and they're officially endorsed by the parties to CMS so giving them an official standing and parties really sort of in the end um, saying they want to apply um, these guidelines and then these come with technical support information and I'm going to show you a little bit more detail of those two products really. So here you see the table of contents of the CMS family guidelines and they're called that because they're not only um, developed for CMS parties themselves but they've also been presented to relevant agreement parties and signatories to the MOU so um, they're being spread as widely as possible and you'll see that besides giving some sort of background information they contain specific guidelines for uh, different types of activities in the marine environment that um, can have an an effect, a negative effect on marine species. And these guidelines are really developed as a tool for national regulators to use. So if someone gets an application for some project in the marine environment, they can use these guidelines to check what they need to require in an EIA in order to be able to make a proper assessment um, of some potential impacts of this activity and whether or not it can go ahead or if so with with what uh, requirements. So really sort of a, a tool for decision makers at the national level. Um, and then as I mentioned they come along with technical support information. You see the cover here it was already on an earlier slide as well um, that goes a little bit deeper into these things to help national regulators to really be able to make sense of what they're then seeing in the EIAs they're being presented with. 
Um, and just a module I want to highlight specifically is this expert advice on specific species groups, because it really explains how the different um, species are affected uh, by it, what we know and what we didn't know at the time. Um, there also certainly will be an update of that um, at some point. And at the last conference of the parties, actually this advisory note mentioned here at the bottom was um, added to the technical support information. Um, so it's also officially welcomed um, because independent modeling is really in many cases still our key tool for assessing impacts. Uh, the work of CMS and the two citation agreements, uh, ASCOMANS and ACOMANS, um, both sort of around Europe, um, is supported by the Joint Noise Working Group, as we call it. Um, it's a specialized working group uh, composed of experts uh, from science, policy and, and relevant civil society organizations um, that was really established to provide that expert knowledge and advice to the parties, but through the scientific and advisory bodies um, of the uh, three treaties that the Joint Noise Working Group serves. Um, and the Joint Noise Working Group itself benefits from uh, advice from an industry advisory group um, that is being consulted whenever questions come up of technical feasibility um, of any post mitigation measures or um, alternative technologies that could be used and all that. Um, so the, this industry advisory group uh, includes experts from various sectors um, and we're still trying to expand it. Um, so more membership is, is certainly welcome. And just as an outlook, um, coming soon is a report on best available technology and best environmental practice for three noise sources, shipping, seismic air gun service and pile driving. Um, so this is going to go into quite a bit of detail. Um, an earlier version was published at the last conference of parties, but um, much more work's gone into it, including um, based on advice from the industry advisory group. Um, so we hope to have really sort of detailed discussion of what can be done um, in, uh, with different approaches for technology and, and also practice there. And uh, with that, I thank you for the attention. I'm really looking forward to continuing to work sort of hand in hand with CBD as we've been doing. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential in that and for any questions or so, um, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, it's it's really interesting to see much the the very sort of uh, technical focused work and and also to hear about the the the, the forthcoming uh, the forthcoming um, the forthcoming work as well. It's 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 quite interesting to hear how things are evolving in CMS. Um, I should also tell those who are watching, um, as you may have seen, you you unfortunately are unable to unmute yourself and speak and ask questions. Uh, we have a lot of people following, which is great, but. Um, we have to <laughs> make it a bit difficult if we could all jump in and talk, but um, we can accept your questions. We do have a question box where you can submit, and I see a number of you have submitted questions already, which is great. Uh, once we get through the panel, we'll have time to address some of these. So if you have any uh, questions specific to any of the panelists, any of the presentations, or perhaps about the issue and this work generally, please feel free to put those in the, the question box. So now we turn from... Uh, from migratory species, looking at this issue through the lens of uh, the, the, the biodiversity of the migratory species, to looking at it through the lens of a specific of a specific sector, a specific activity. So, in that respect, we're really happy to have with us uh, Andrew Birchenow from the International Maritime Organization uh, to give us a bit of an update of work that's going on at the IMO. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for being on this uh, on this webinar with us and giving us this uh, this update. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Joe, and um, welcome. Nice to see so many people on, on the webinar today. And yeah, firstly, I'd just like to add my congratulations to, uh, and particularly here from the IMO, for the uh, the review that you have published, and I'm sure it will be invaluable in the, in the work of the IMO and particularly the member states that we're undertaking on the issue of underwater noise uh, in, in the near future. Uh, and what I'm going to do today is just give you a, 
a, a little bit of an overview of what we what we have done previously, and hopefully the a direction of where we are we are going uh, with with work in uh, addressing underwater anthropogenic under, uh, noise from from shipping activities, commercial shipping activities. Um, my name's Andrew Birchinoff. I actually work here at the IMO in London. Uh, in the Marine Environment Division, in the Office for the London Convention Protocol and Ocean Affairs, and uh, we uh, cover one of the issues we do cover is 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 under is underwater noise. Um, so if I could have the next slide, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Uh, just depending on who's on, some people might not be that familiar with the with the IMO, the International Maritime Organization. It's the UN specialized agency responsible for shipping, safe, secure and efficient shipping, and also the prevention of pollution from shipping activities. Um, we have uh, 175 member states, and they include all major ship owning nations and coastal coastal states and we have uh, a wide range of issues that we our mandate covered that uh, to prevent and control pollution uh, and mitigate the effects of any damage that uh, may result of, uh, from maritime operations and accidents so our, our main role is really to create a regulatory framework for shipping industry which is not only effective and fair, but uh, it can be globally uh, adopted and implemented. And to do that, we develop global regulations, adopt treaties and guidelines, guidelines at that intergovernmental level. And those measures can uh, cover all aspects of international shipping from ship design and construction, to the manning and operation of ships and in, including uh, dumping, but uh, with the overall um, aim of uh, safe, secure and efficient shipping on cleaner oceans, as you can see there. Um, next, next slide, please. Thanks. So in terms of, I mean, I'm sure it's 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 a given now that, uh, that shipping and, and vessels uh, have an impact and create underwater underwater sound, which has an impact on uh, negative impact on marine life. And for ships, the 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 sound levels and the frequency spe spectrum which that noise uh, relates to comes from a, a number of factors, including the size of the vessel, loading, the speed, obviously the age, engine type, and particularly the propeller design. And we all no, there's a predicted and, and ever increasing growth of international commercial shipping. That sector is expected to increase and, and as a result may likely to contribute, if it's left unabated, to contribute to underwater noise progressively. And uh, importantly, shipping and commercial shipping traffic often uh, transects or comes close to sensitive marine marine habitats and that's where you know we're likely to have the main issue so close to sort of cetacean um, uh, uh, areas and um, where, where they where they move and uh, migrate um, next next slide please so in terms of the IMO and the action um, really it was around 2004 and it was in re IMO really started to address the issue and it was in response to a growing body of research that was emerging on on this issue uh, and it was through the MEPC which is the IMO's Marine Environmental Protection Committee that really started discussions on the harmful impacts of underwater noise from ships on marine life in, in, in 2004. And it was noted that anthropogenic noise in the ocean was obviously generated by ships primarily, and it recognized that the issue from commercial ships had a significant and deleterious effects on critical functions of a wide range of uh, marine uh, flora, 
uh, sorry, fauna, uh, primarily cetaceans then, and as we're coming to, to find out now, and we're ever getting ever more increasing information on a, a wide range of other uh, taxes of fish species and invertebrates. But it was also identified that ships obviously routinely cross international boundaries, so the management of um, noise required a co coordinated international response. So in 2008, uh, underwater noise was added to the agenda of MEPC as a high priority work item. And the committee agreed to initiate the development of uh, non-mandatory technical guidelines, recognizing that it was an issue that could be mitigated uh, and addressing concerns about sort of short and long-term impacts on marine life and especially marine marine mammals and you can see there's just a bit of a timeline there but that those discussions and those interactions with the member states and various correspondence groups uh, resulted in the approval uh, of guidelines which were published in 2014 uh, if you could put my next slide on please so those guidelines were entitled IMO guidelines for the reduction of underwater noise from commercial shipping to address adverse impacts on marine life. And as I mentioned, they were, they were non-mandatory, but provided general advice on the issue, uh, specifically aimed at designers, shipbuilders, shipper op operators, uh, and primarily focusing uh, on, pro sorry, focusing primarily on under underwater noise, uh, namely on the propellers, uh, hull form, onboard machinery, and various operational and maintenance recommendations, such as things like hull cleaning. Um, much of that underwater noise it was identified was caused by propellers and propeller cavitation, but uh, onboard machinery as well uh, was also uh, included. The guidelines themselves um, introduce definitions uh, and underwater noise measurement standards, but at the time of adoption, IMO particularly noted that there were significant knowledge knowledge gaps. Uh, you might, just, if you could just flick onto the next slide as well, uh, significant uh, significant gaps and. They did not set targets for underwater sound levels emanating from ships uh, as more research was needed. And uh, at the time, 2014, the, the, the committee invited member states, interested member states and observer organizations to um, submit proposals for future uh, appropriate outputs to future sessions of the, the MEPC. And certainly since the, the, the guidelines were adopted in 2014, we've seen a, a, you know, an increasing body of research and uh, understanding of underwater noise, the impacts of noise, and uh, the more knowledge of the impacts, uh, sorry, of the noise emitted from commercial ships. Uh, and with that, there's been an increasing awareness among IMO member states of the need to take further action. So further information in the, has been submitted to the MEPC committee and that's been uh, discussed and submissions have highlighted uh, recent quiet ship technology, uh, other complementary international action, uh, as I mentioned, a growing scientific evidence base on the impacts uh, and ultimately the need for further collaboration and action by the international community and uh, Canada uh, has been a, a member state that's been particularly at the forefront of that. Uh, next slide please. So um, in terms of where we are now and what the proposed actions, uh, recently in 2021 last year at MEP 76, MEPC 76, um, the committee considered a new work output on reducing underwater ship noise and um, received quite a number of uh, documents on the issue and uh, they were very much supportive of uh, addressing the, the work uh, further and 
they um, agreed to refer the issue to the what we call the SDC, SDC, the Ship Design and Construction Subcommittee for Action. That subcommittee uh, recently met at the start of this year in February uh, and agreed uh, a work plan to review the 2014 guidelines. And to do that, they've established a correspondence group. Uh, the ultimate aim of this will be uh, to develop a further program of action to identify next steps uh, to addressing the, the issue in terms of uh, commercial shipping. But uh, just highlighted a couple of bullet points there. The actions to prevent and further reduce underwater noise from ships, including operations to integrate new and advancing technologies uh, and into and or vessel design solutions. And also, importantly, to consider the impact and interrelation with other proposed actions in the context of uh, shipping. So in terms of our other regulatory goals, such as energy efficiency uh, and so on. Um, so the, that uh, design committee has no mandate at the moment to develop a mandatory instrument, but it's something that it may uh, actually consider as a future next step. And that will be obviously reported back to the Marine Environmental Protection Committee. Uh, and uh, hopefully the, the guidelines will be updated and um, the member states will be uh, deciding on what action we need to take to further address this issue from, from uh, commercial vessels. Next slide, please. And finally, I just did want to highlight um, that underwater noise is also uh, addressed and can be in, taken into account through um, the particular sensitive sea areas designation, which is um, shipping based, uh, a marine based management tool from the shipping sector. And uh, these are areas are considered for designation. And they deserve, basically deserve special protection due to certain uh, either ecological, socioeconomic or scientific significance, which may be vulnerable to damage from international shipping and uh, noises listed uh, in the revised PSSA guidelines. And it's recognized that noise from ships can be adversely affect marine environment and these issues can be uh, addressed through that and particular tools we have uh, under the PSSA uh, are really uh, more specific area-based management tools so um, so what we call association uh, protective measures such as traffic separation schemes or areas to be avoided uh, and uh, it's uh, likely no doubt that um, you know, we will be receiving future uh, proposals for PSSA's de de designation into the future. And I'm sure that noise, uh, as it becomes ever more increasingly uh, uh, identified and important, that will be included in those, in those uh, designations. So with that, I think that's, that's it for me. I may have just one last slide. I can't quite remember what it is, it might just be a thank you. Yeah, and uh, uh, hopefully you found that informative. Thank you, back to you, Joe. Yeah. Thanks so much, Andrew. It's it's really uh, interesting to hear that there already are quite a lot of uh, resources for, for governments, for, for developers, for industry to look look at, and those those guidelines and resources are continuing to be improved and, and further developed. So it's it's quite interesting to hear about this work. So thank you very much. So now we turn to another uh, global uh, global organization, uh, the International Whaling Commission, the IWC, where our colleague uh, Russell Leeper will give an update on the work on underwater noise under IWC. Please, Russell, the floor is yours. Thanks, Joe. Um, the International Whaling Commission is, is the global body with a mandate for the conservation of, of whales. When IWC considers conservation, this includes all the cetaceans, which is the collective term for whales, dolphins, and porpoises. If we can move on to the next slide. So the IWC has been concerned about the impacts of underwater noise on cetaceans for around the last 20 years. And the early work was, was mainly related to the effects of military sonar, because this was directly linked to the deaths of 
for big trials. I think it's, <coughs> these whales were, were turning up stranded on, on beaches um, following military sonar exercises. Um, and the IWC has also facilitated an independent review of, of mass mortality events, including melon-headed whales that stranded in Madagascar in 2008. But subsequent to this, there's been as much concern about chronic as, as well as acute effects of underwater noise. And the IWC has noted that there's evidence indicating that chronic anthropogenic underwater noise is affecting the marine environment in many regions, with emerging evidence that comprised acoustic habitat may adversely affect several cetacean populations. And the IWC Scientific Committee agreed in 2016 that addressing ocean noise is, is essential to meet the, the UN sustainable development targets with respect to reducing pollution. In a resolution that the IWC adopted in, in 2018, um, it welcomed the increased attention being given to the, the underwater noise issue by international bodies, and also that in, in line with the precautionary approach, um, the lack of full scientific certainty shouldn't be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to address underwater noise. Next slide, please. So one of the, the main sources of, of underwater noise of particular concern for cetaceans has been the the use of air guns um, during seismic surveys, prospecting for, for oil and gas reserves. Um, a particular area where the IWC has, has concentrated and worked with governments, industry and the IUCN has been to develop guidelines for mitigation and monitoring for seismic surveys off, off Sakhalin Island. This is a, a primary feeding area for a critically endangered population of, of grey whales. And this work has really kind of set the scene for, for other uh, assessments of the impacts of seismic surveys in, in other areas. And in particular, the, the IWC has, has used its expertise in, in cetacean surveys and understanding how, how observers see whales when looking at how effective marine mammal observers can be in terms of mitigation. And the committee, the scientific committee of the IWC has recommended that whenever marine mammal observers that are proposed as a mitigation measure, then the expected risk reduction should be quantified. Another source of underwater noise is shipping, as we heard from Andrew. And if we could move on to the next slide. Thanks. Um, the IWC has been collaborating with, with the IMO since it, it put the issue on it on, back on its agenda in, in 2008, I think Andrew corrected me on that. Um, and in 2014, we sponsored a, a workshop with, with NOAA in, in, in the US to, to look at predicting sound fields and, and global soundscape modeling to inform management of cetaceans with respect to noise. Another workshop in, in 2016 focused on concerns related to the masking effect of, of noise and this is a particular concern for, for whales that communicate over long distances and sounds that mask what they can hear can affect their communication space. And in 2020 the Scientific Committee of IWC held a workshop on, on advancing efforts to address underwater noise from shipping. And many of the concerns about noise from shipping have arisen because of the impacts on baleen whales, which are, are low frequency specialists, which overlap in frequency with, with the most intense sounds from, from ships. Um, Although the IWC interest has been largely on the direct impacts of cetaceans, we're now looking more at other ecosystem effects, and particularly those that affect prey species, which by extension will affect cetaceans. Uh, next slide, please. 
So in terms of future work, um, in 2008, the, the committee endorsed noise reduction targets for a goal related to, to shipping noise and the contribution of shipping noise to, to ambient noise energy. This target has been reviewed and, and it's now been in place for, for some years and there's been a lot of work since then. And it seems like it, it, it seems rather simplistic with the, the view of the, the recent work. So there's broad agreement that there's a need for a clear target on lowering ship noise to facilitate regulation and that the target should not be too complex. However, there's concerns that a 3 dB or a 10 dB target as endorsed by the IWC is, is rather simplistic and particularly that it may not apply to the, the full bandwidth of frequencies that are, are impacted by, by noise from vessels. So the IWC will continue its work on underwater noise through both scientific and conservation committees and in particular we will contribute to the the IMO work that, that Andrew described on, on revising the 2014 guidelines and, and next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Russell, for that uh, interesting update. Uh, as I think that illustrates, uh, there's quite a lot of, of, of resources, guidance, and, and, and work out there on these issues. And, and in fact, uh, also, I think, illustrating it, as you noted at the end, the importance of, of these uh, inter-institutional linkages and, and how these, these respective areas of, of, of work ac across our different organizations uh, can, can, can and perhaps should be uh, linked together and, and, and sources and, and providing to, you know, to, to serve our, our respective parties, in many cases, who are all the same governments that we're talking about. So I think building these, these, uh, these, these cross-process linkages um, is really useful, not only for, for the work, but also for the governments to have a much more clear picture of what they need to do. Um, so with that, um, we're going to turn from the global to the regional and look at some specific regions and regional organizations that are also advancing work on this issue. Um, of course, um, these are not all of the global organizations and regional organizations that are looking at this issue. There are many others that we don't have time to unfortunately go through. But uh, now as we turn to the regional, uh, we are very happy to have with us uh, Dominic Pattinson from the OSPAR Commission, which is the uh, regional organization focused on the marine environment for the Northeast Atlantic, uh, to give us an update on the work on noise in, in your part of the world. Please, Dominic, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Joe, and uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, everyone, um, for inviting us uh, to have this opportunity to to do a brief presentation on on OSPAR's work on on underwater noise. Um, I should just, uh, I, I noticed that other presenters gave a, a brief introduction of their organization and I, I haven't got a slide on that. So, so very briefly, o OSPAR is the, is the regional sea convention for the, for the Northeast Atlantic. We've got 16 contracting parties from Iceland and Norway in, in the north down to sort of Portugal and, and Spain in, in the south and sort of all the coastal states in, in between and the, the European Union as well. So um, like other, like other speakers we've been looking at underwater noise for a number of years now but sort of uh, um, I'm going to highlight a few sort of uh, areas of our work that are sort of really sort of taken off in the last few years and a bit of what we're doing in the future. Um, the um, sorry and yes I'm Dominic Pattinson I'm, I'm the executive secretary uh, at the, sec the OSPAR secretariat so uh, um, you know with an overview of this work but by no means an expert. So. Um, the, the three things that I wanted to talk about today were the work that we've been doing on uh, monitoring, so the, the indicators that we're developing to, to, to monitor underwater noise, then a, a bit about what we're doing in terms of assessing uh, the results of those indicators, and then finally uh, a bit about sort of what we're doing in terms of uh, next steps uh, in, in addressing the, the impacts of, of underwater noise um, going forward. So if I could have the next slide, please. So yeah, so as I mentioned, so we've developed over the last few years, we've developed three core indicators for assessing um, underwater noise. Um, the, the first and you know picking up on what the other speakers have, have been talking about. 
the first is sort of looking at the pressure from from impulsive noise so the sort of uh, short blasts of, uh, uh, of sound that you get and we measure that in something that we call block pulse days um, and we've got an indicator that looks at that and some of the, the images there on this slide show how that is then represented so you get a sort of idea of the, the spread of where the noise is happening um, and over how many days uh, that it's happening and it gives us a sort of a bit of an insight into into what's going on. You'll see from those images that this work is mainly focused around the sort of North Sea and Celtic Seas um, uh, of our area, um, but we're looking to sort of expand that, that work to the other sort of OSPAR regions as well. Um, the second indicator that we've got, um, which is focused just on the North Sea, is uh, what we call a risk of impact. Um, and this is sort of trying to combine the sort of species and habitats that are sensitive to underwater noise and where the noise is happening. So again, it's all about getting information that helps us to assess where and when and uh, what sort of um, measures we should, be, we should be looking to take. And then the third, uh, third indicator that we've got is around continuous noise. So the mainly the sort of shipping noise that, that Andy was uh, was talking about from uh, earlier um, and again this this isn't so the other two are sort of common indicators that we've adopted this one is a, a candidate indicator but we'll still be presenting a sort of full assessment of this indicator um, going forward and I think what's what's really interesting with this indicator is it's based on, on models that gives us the opportunity to sort of um, play around with different scenarios to see what the effects of uh, increased sort of activity uh, would look like um, in terms of uh, impacts of, of underwater noise. Um, next slide please. So uh, quality status report, so every 10 years or so OSPAR does a, a full uh, assessment of the state of the marine environment of the northeast Atlantic. Um, which we call our sort of quality status reports and we're due to um, publish our next one in 2023. It's been a bit delayed by uh, COVID like a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things um, and as part of that it's, it's the, the report is made up of a series of thematic assessments across the whole range of, of OSPAR's work and, and one of those uh, thematic assessments is focused on underwater noise um, and then those thematic assessments will get pulled into uh, pulled together into a, a synthesis report, which will be the the QSR report. Um, for each of the thematic assessments, we've we've tried to sort of follow the um, the DAPSIR approach. So um, just to try and explain that in, in in layman's terms, so we we look at what is is causing the the activity, the pressures to happen. So what are the drivers behind uh, the sort of pressures and activities so often that's you know what's causing the human activity to take place in the first place what's what's making it happen and then you look at the specific activities that cause the pressure and then the the actual effects of those pressures and then looking at those what is the impact on the state of the marine environment and then what are the impacts and then finally and, and maybe most importantly we try and assess what our response should be to those uh, uh, pressures the state, the impact that it's having. So each of our thematic assessments, including the one on underwater noise, um, is, is based around that framework. And we, we hope that that's a, a really interesting and sort of new way of looking, uh, um, not necessarily new, but uh, we've got the information to sort of go behind sort of looking at that, at that approach. And, and we hope that that thematic assessment will be published later this year uh, as part of a first batch of thematic assessments. Um, and then, as it says there on the slide, the sort of full assessment will will be published uh, in 2023. Um, and then the next slide, please. Then just focusing going forward. Last year we had one of our um, ministerial meetings um, where we agreed a new uh, a new strategy uh, that will guide OSPAR's work for the next uh, well to the end of the, the decade. Um, and as part of that, uh, that strategy, which sets out how we work and, and what we will work on, 
um, there's a, a, a series of strategic objectives and uh, so you can see their strategic objective eight on reducing anthropogenic underwater noise to, to levels that do not adversely affect the marine environment. And then underneath those strategic objectives, there's a series of uh, operational objectives. And this is where we've tried to articulate what we think OSPO should be doing to achieve those strategic objectives. And you can see there that um, following the model that we've taken on marine litter, um, where we've had a regional action plan in place since 2014, um, we're going to develop a regional action plan setting out a series of uh, national and collective actions um, on how to address underwater noise uh, in the OSPAR area. Now, obviously, um, to do that, we will need to work with others, um, and particularly um, organisations like the IMO. Um, the, the decisions and recommendations that OSPAR adopts are, are only binding on its contracting parties. So this is very much, a sort of, I hope, will be a, a collaborative process um, going forward. And uh, yeah, we, we, we hope that the, the plan will be um, will sort of set a, a good example um, for how to sort of address underwater noise uh, going forward, and in particular add value to to other processes and uh, other organisations work. Uh, on underwater noise. So, as I say, hopefully very much a collaborative effort with, with others. And it's been, it's been really useful um, sort of listening to the updates from, from people today um, uh, and the work that they're doing and how that can feed into our work going forward. Um, so, I think that's probably my last slide, except for the thank you slide at the end. But just to say what sort of good timing the, uh, the CBD report is for us, because we will use it as a, I think, as others have said, as a as a resource tool to guide our work on um, going forward on, on underwater noise. So, um, as others said, you know, big thank you for for everyone involved in its production. Um, uh, having had a quick look at it, I think it will will be really helpful in in guiding our work going forward. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Joe. Yeah, thanks so much, Dominic. And I think as as you uh, pointed out, actually. Uh, you know, of course, we hope this webinar is useful to the participants, to the viewers, but it's actually quite a very useful discussion for all of us on this call as well. I'm learning quite a lot, and I think, you know, in our busy worlds, we often don't have enough time to have these conversations. So this is a really educational for 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 myself, and I hope for all of you as well. Um, now we turn, last but not least, to our final uh, our final panelist. Um, who will give us an update on uh, going to a different part of the world, to a little slightly more, slightly more colder part of the world, and up in the Arctic, uh, which uh, uh, from uh, our colleague from WWF, Melanie Lancaster, will give us an update on the work under the Protection of the Arctic Marine Environment Working Group of the Arctic Council, or PAME. So, please, Melanie, go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, as, as you said there, I'll speak a little about the work being done by the Arctic Council to understand uh, underwater noise uh, in the Arctic. And as you mentioned, most of that work has happened in one of the Arctic Council's working group, um, which is the PAIM working group, which stands for Protection of the Arctic Marine Environment. And of course, the Arctic Council uh, consists of uh, its eight member states, including Canada, Kingdom of Denmark and Greenland, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Russia, and the US. It also includes permanent participants, uh, which are six indigenous peoples organizations um, representing the Arctic and includes a number of observer states and organizations of which WWF's Arctic program is one. So over the last five years, WWF has been working with a number of member states and observers in the Arctic Council on the issue of underwater noise. And because the Arctic Council is currently on pause, um, Arctic governments are restricted in terms of what they can engage in. So I volunteered to give a little overview here of that work. Next slide, thanks. Okay, as we've already heard um, today, sound is essential for um, marine mammals, but is also incredibly important for marine life in general, everything from invertebrates, fishes, again, right up into to the biggest um, biggest species that we have uh, in the oceans. Um, and, and these species have evolved the use of sound as a really important sense. Um, 
to the point where it's critical for their survival. So um, we know the most about marine mammals, but we know that many species use um, under use sound underwater to navigate, avoid danger, find food, and find mates. Um, instead of talking about it, I'm actually hoping I can let you listen to um, marine life using underwater sound. And I don't know if that will work, but let's see if um, if we hit the little speaker button, do we get some sound? Maybe not. There's a there was an MP3 file associated with it. That sound like it looks like something's playing. I might have to just describe it anyway. Um, this was a recording that was. Jackie, perhaps no. if you. There it is. Okay. Mm, that's okay. We can we can move on. That's sounding even more otherworldly than it actually does sound. Um, but this was it was a recording. That's my colleague there. She actually threw a, an underwater microphone into the. Um, the Alaskan Arctic just off the ice edge, which is in the uh, the Bering Strait. And she said above the water, it was this unusually sort of windless still day. And as soon as um, as soon as they put the uh, the microphone under the water, it just became this amazing kind of cacophony of sounds being made by beluga whales, bearded seals and bowhead whales. But you'll have to just trust me um, because we haven't been able to hear that today. Um, but next slide, thanks. So um, hopefully we're moving on with the slide there, but yep, that's great. So um, why are we interested in the Arctic specifically when we want to think about underwater noise and sound? Uh, and when we talk about the Arctic Ocean, we often talk about it being a special case when it comes to underwater sound. And that's for a few reasons. Um, and, and I'm not a specialist here, so this will be a, a very simplified explanation, but for one, cold water temperature and salinity in the Arctic Ocean means that sound actually travels really long distances at shallow depths. And this is quite different from more temperate oceans in the world where most, where the sort of long ranging sound channel actually sits between 500 and 1000 metres, so much deeper, whereas in the Arctic Ocean, it sits at the surface downwards. So what this means is that noise that is generated at the water surface, for example, from ships, travels long distances. Um, and of course, from the surface down, um, overlaps with swimming and diving depths of a lot of uh, marine species, including marine mammals, which breathe air, so are regularly coming up to the surface to breathe. So the graphic here, the first graphic here, which is a grid, um, shows modelled noise signatures of 16 ships in the tropics on the top. Um, versus the Arctic. So this is where, if you imagine sort of the heat signature being a noise signature, uh, you can see that in the colder waters, those um, noise signatures of ships actually sort of travels um, further. So it's more expanded. The other reason the Arctic's a special case uh, is because ice, it has ice cover. So for large parts of the year and in some parts of the Arctic all of the year, um, the, the ocean's covered with sea ice. And that Ice is a, itself a source of sound, but it also changes how sound travels underwater. So as sound waves actually hit the sea ice at the water surface, it tends to diffuse and scatter um, the, the sound. So when the ocean's ice covered, sound and noise actually don't travel as far as when the ocean is ice free. And you can see an example here on the right. So on the right, you've got um, one ship, the little red dot here, and uh, at the the top figure would show that's actually between Canada and Greenland in Baffin Bay. So um, the top shows noise from a single ship without uh, sea ice cover, and then the bottom would be with sea ice cover. So without sea ice cover, this ship can actually insonify the whole bay, which is a huge area. But when ice is present, the noise is much more contained. Um, also, uh, icebreakers are used for Arctic operations in shipping. So they're a source of additional and different noise uh, to the noise produced by ships in some of the world's uh, other oceans. And finally, marine mammals and ships use some of the same transit routes. So if you can imagine um, an ocean that's largely covered with sea ice, um, ships would be in a lot of cases trying to navigate where the ice is thinnest or absent and animals like marine mammals also use those areas to come up and breathe. Next slide, thanks. 
So since, uh, since 2017, the uh, PAIM Working Group of the Arctic Council has been working on underwater noise. In 2019, PAIM released a State of Knowledge report on underwater noise in the Arctic. And the work was co-led by Canada, WWF and OSFA, and it was authored by Dr Bill Halliday from the Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada. And that report is a, a really good baseline for the Arctic. It summarises what's known about the issue and covers multiple sources of anthropogenic noise. Um, our understanding of specific effects of underwater noise on Arctic marine life is quite limited, but we know that there's great potential for effects. And you can see this figure on the left here. Um, the two, two blue bars at the bottom show um, the frequency range of noise produced by ships and icebreakers. And then above that are a whole range of different, um, in this case, marine mammal species. So there's substantial and even at times complete overlap in the frequency of noise that's created by ships and the frequencies that are used by many Arctic species. And I should mention here that um, I think all of these, or more or less all of these are really important to Arctic Indigenous peoples for their culture, traditions and food security. Um, so, while we don't know a lot, we do have some examples of responses and impacts, and I won't go into them here on the right, but. Um, this is looking at shipping in particular, but uh, just lists what we know about fish, invertebrates, um, Pacific walrus, beluga whales, and a lot of that information can actually be found in that 2019 State of Knowledge report. And as with the rest of the world, we have got a growing body of information about the effects of underwater noise on Arctic species and ecosystems. Next slide, thanks. As we know, climate change is warming the Arctic almost three times as fast, uh, three times faster than the rest of the planet. So that's one of the major effects of that is sea ice loss. Um, and that has been a natural barrier to development of the Arctic. Um, so now the Arctic Ocean is actually opening up to industrial development. And of course that includes noise producing activities, uh, including shipping, uh, oil and gas development and marine infrastructure. Um, and, and going back to shipping, uh, it's, it's been the main source of work done by the Arctic Council so far. Um, and in the graphic on the right, uh, you can see where the main shipping activity across the Arctic has been concentrated over the last several years. And the reason that we're interested in shipping in the Arctic is, um, is because the number of ships operating in the Arctic is increasing because of this loss of sea ice. And there's an um, PAIM have actually done multiple reports um, on the status of shipping in the Arctic that can be found on their website. And that, um, that work describes trends in, um, in ships and their distance sailed and in areas that they're going into, including major passages that would be used for commercial shipping. And the, I guess the other thing that's really important is looking forward into the future. So, Projected increases in shipping are substantial. There's three new transarctic shipping routes that are possible in the future, depending on um, how, how much sea ice is lost and when it's lost. And multiple of those routes actually offer shorter distances and time compared to the Suez and Panama canals. So for, you can imagine, for example, they're quite attractive um, to ship operators and shipping companies. Next slide, thanks. Okay, so focusing on shipping, um, PAIM released a, a report on underwater noise in 2021. And that was a report on which Canada, the German Environment Agency and WWF co-led. And this was really the first time that underwater noise had been modelled and mapped across the Arctic Ocean from shipping. So there's a couple of figures here. So the top figure is underwater noise from shipping in March when sea ice is at its maximum. You can see sea ice is here in white. Uh, and then um, underwater noise from shipping in September when sea ice was the warmest part, um, warmest time of the, the year and where sea ice is at its minimum. So you can see here that um, underwater noise from shipping and shipping itself uh, really expands into the Arctic and there's even underwater noise right here in the central Arctic basin under some of this sea ice. So a major finding of the report um, was that in some regions there was a significant increase in, and well, I shouldn't say significant, although I think actually statistically it was, there was a large increase in 
underwater noise levels in some parts of the Arctic over a pretty short period, so over the last six years or six years between 2013 and 2019. Um, and that increase was much faster than has been seen in other oceans. So an increase of that magnitude, for example, took 30 to 40 years in the North Pacific Ocean. So what do those findings mean when we talk about marine life and ecosystems? So a doubling of ship noise volume means that the communication space for marine mammals which is the area over which they can receive sound is greatly reduced. Um, and if we think back to that first slide on how marine mammals use sound, that reduction in communication space is likely affecting um, their ability to you know, perform major life functions like finding food, navigating, mothers staying in touch with young, groups staying in touch um, while migrating, lots of different things. Um, and for example, a three decibel increase in ship noise can reduce communication space by um, a factor of four. So a three decibel increase can actually shrink communication space to a quarter of its size in a noise-free environment. So we think this work that was done by PAME is actually really important. Um, next slide, thanks. And fortunately, this work has continued. So PAME currently has two projects on underwater noise. Um, the first is a continuation of this work that was completed in 2021 um, and it will work to understand um, underwater noise distribution and levels from shipping projected to 2030. It will also ground truth um, modelling that has been done in particular regions that we know to be important for noise sensitive species. And finally, which is the part I think I find most exciting, it will model um, various scenarios to understand how changes in ship operations and technology might actually affect underwater noise. So for example, if you were to move all ships into a corridor, how would that affect how underwater noise spreads across a bay or um, a sea? If you were to reduce underwater noise at the source, either by slowing ships down or by um, some of the things we've heard today around in improving propeller design, how would that potentially drop underwater noise levels? And so what this modelling will do is hopefully start to create decision support tools for shipping in the Arctic. And then there's one final project, um, which is actually focusing on oil and gas. And that's a project led by the US, the UK and co-led with WWF. And that's really to understand current management by Arctic states of underwater noise from marine oil and gas activity. So it will be kind of a baseline, I think, from which um, more work can be done. Um, thank you, that's all from me. I've got just one last slide there um, that summarises the various work that is being done by the Arctic Council and all of that can be found on the PAME website. Thanks. Thank you so much, Melanie, for that update. Uh, it's a shame we couldn't hear the, the sounds there, but I guess if we've heard in this, in this webinar, less noise is better. So that's that's quite all right <laughs> um i know i understand we're, we're a little bit over time so if any of our panelists have to hop off and pursue uh, other other meetings uh, please feel free to do so um, but i have just some brief wrap-up uh remarks and then we can um, just take a few questions we have some interesting questions that are being posed that i think our panelists might uh, wish to comment on um, but for now i'm going to just pull us uh i'm going to bring us back to the cbd um, where we have important work going on right now to develop uh, new uh, global biodiversity targets um, and how we see this issue uh, fitting into the to that new framework so as many of you and as i as, as i mentioned before as, and as many of you probably know uh, the ICHI biodiversity targets have been a main focus of work under the convention for um, for a long time and in particular from the 2010 to 2020 period um, <clears throat> Now, with the end of the IQ biodiversity targets, the parties to the CBD are presently negotiating a new global biodiversity framework, which currently is called the Post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, um, and is actually still under negotiation and will be submitted for adoption at CBD COP15 later this year. Um, this will address a wide range of topics relevant to the conservation and sustainable use of, of biodiversity, but also has a number of important implications for underwater noise. <clears throat> Now this is all, <clears throat> excuse me, this is all still under negotiation. And in fact, some of these targets uh, have, have not yet been updated <clears throat> based on the last uh, negotiations that were held in Geneva. But we can see nonetheless 
the draft targets there that some of which are relevant to underwater noise, including target one on integrated biodiversity inclusive spatial planning, draft target seven focused specifically on pollution, and we can consider noise pollution in that respect as well. A draft target 14 on integrating biodiversity values into all levels of government and sectors. And draft target 15 looking at uh, having all businesses assessing and reporting their dependencies and impact on biodiversity and working to reduce those uh, negative impacts. So we see a number of ways in which noise can and, and should be addressed in the context of these targets. And as we've seen, <clears throat> as we've seen from the failure to fully achieve the IG biodiversity targets, um, we really need a portfolio of actions and responses to bend the curve of biodiversity loss. One set of actions, be it conservation on its own or, or reduced consumption on its own, is not going to be enough to bring us in the direction that we need to go. So we need a, this portfolio, and underwater noise uh, needs to be a part of that portfolio. This is, again, why the issue of mainstreaming biodiversity considerations into sectors is so important. <laughs> and this is not only a bit of a new paradigm, this term mainstreaming, but it's actually a key part of the convention, Article 6B right there, which was in the convention itself from 1992. It's, uh, it really calls for, in fact, mainstreaming biodiversity into uh, sectoral and cross-sectoral plans, programs, and policies. So to do this, um, we need to work together with other entities across the global landscape, other inter intergovernmental international organizations that are working in a more focused, uh, technical, issue-specific way on these different topics to actually make this real uh, on the ground and to work uh, through these different uh, conversations that are looking at this issue through a specific lens. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, a, a key a key consideration here is is what COVID-19 has done. Um, so we've heard about building back better, but perhaps we need to, we also need to build back quieter. Uh, COVID-19, as we know, brought a, a great quieting to the global oceans, um, and we do perhaps have a better understanding of of what the oceans sound like without us, or at least with less of us. So as we shift to a new normal, we need to. It's critical for governments and industry to make use of different approaches to avoid bringing back unsustainable levels of noise into the ocean. So as, as overall, we see that there is increasing attention, rapidly evolving work in the intergovernmental sphere, but these actions and targets and work and frameworks uh, need to be translated to on the ground action. And this is where we need actual, we need governments, uh, companies, organizations, communities, and all of, all of you, all of us to, to actually make this real on the ground. So finally, uh, just another plug again, this report is available online uh, as of this morning on the CBD website, a CBD technical series report number 99. And uh, again, many thanks to the European Union for the kind financial support for making this possible. And we hope this uh, this this report can be useful at, at different levels, at, at many different levels as an important reference point for this uh, for this issue. So uh, with that, I will just open for a few questions. Um, I see that we've had a number of questions posed. Um, unfortunately, I'm only going to have to pick a few because uh, we have we don't have much time. Um, but I see uh, an interesting question about uh, you know ab about the uptake of all of this work. So we have you know guidelines evolving and emerging and, and guidance improving. But um, how do we encourage, how do we get governments, states, shipping companies, you know, the industry to actually use them, to take them up and to make them a part of how they're actually doing their work and practicing? So uh, that's certainly, I think, relevant to all of us. But please, does anyone on the call, any, any of our panelists want to want to tackle this, 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 uh, this challenging but nonetheless really pertinent question? Please, Andrew, go ahead. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's certainly an in, interesting, in, interesting question. And, and the perspective of the IMO, the 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 guidelines that are currently in place are are non-mandatory. So there's always that issue um, with other IMO uh, conventions and other IMO issues that are mandatory that they they may take precedent over a non-mandatory requirements for certain things. So that is something which has been acknowledged and um, certainly we had um, I think it was uh, around about 2019 uh, the World Maritime University 
did do a project and looked did a survey on looking at the uptake of the IMO guidelines, um, but it found that they were not uh, as the due to that lack of regulation. I think were not as uh, up, up, there wasn't as much uptake as you know we'd we'd hoped. So this is part of the reason why they are actually being being updated now to reflect uh, future and well the current uh, knowledge and information we have. And I think importantly we need uh, in association with that is to have uh, you know sort of capacity building and awareness raising of the issue not obviously it's a it's a big issue in some of the uh, countries we've been mentioning today but in developing countries as well because they are particularly uh, important in you know they've got high stake in international shipping and shipbuilding and so on so it's very important they uh, they are they are engaged in in this process to make sure that uh, any measures are implemented and we're actually looking at a, a potentially looking at a, a global project under GEF global uh, environment uh, facility to to do just that so hopefully that will be coming online in future yeah thank you I think that certainly resonates with what we've heard from our parties as well uh, quite a few, quite a number of our, of our developing country parties you know struggling with with just the the, the core work of what they have to do let alone uh, looking at this this new what from their perspective is a bit of a new issue from their management management framework so new new targets and frameworks bring responsibilities and expectations but unless we have the means of implementation and capacities in place there's not much that can be done in many parts of the world unfortunately um, anyone else want to tackle this i think this is quite relevant to perhaps all of our work but uh, if not i can i can move on to uh, another question no Russell, I see, I hope, is that a bit eager to jump in, please? I think one way that we can improve it is by linking efforts to reduce noise with other in environmental impacts. And you know, particularly in the case of shipping, we can see multiple benefits of, of for certain measures. And in a lot of industries as well, when, when people are considering measures to reduce climate change impacts in particular, these can go alongside noise reductions. I think we have opportunities now for you know, putting noise out there as an issue that needs to be addressed, but thinking about it when we're when we're doing things that we'd be doing for other reasons anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's that's a really useful point, uh, and I think that's what we see as well. The issue of co-benefits and and doing things that deliver multiple outcomes. Uh, Hi, Adrian, please go ahead. Thank you. Yes, I, I was also actually going to raise sort of the collaboration aspect because, I mean, in all our fora that were presented global level and regional level, we are highlighting this issue, which keeps it sort of at, on the political agenda, and we just have to jointly um, keep doing that. Uh, there's also a chance, really, for governments in that we've seen that in, in respect, for example, to the wind farm um, construction, uh, when, for example, the German government set standards that needed to be kept that actually drove innovation in the industry very much um, addressing the issue so there's really a chance for governments by by including regulations even if all the solutions maybe aren't there yet to actually drive the innovation process so that the activities that we are i mean humans won't, won't stop using the oceans <laughs> for all these many uh, things and i mean there might uh, be further increases but to to actually sort of make it a joint effort across um, all sectors but it's certainly something that we still all need to work on jointly yeah thank you very well said and i think and in fact i mean looking at the time we're, we're a bit we're quite a bit late and i and i think this this question was actually perhaps the most all-encompassing of, of how do we make this all real on the ground and perhaps a good place to to, to finish off so um i think with that um we can we can close here uh, thanks so much for the other panelists for joining, for sharing your experiences, and for letting us know what's happening in your in your respective processes. Thanks to the all the participants for following along. Uh, I'm sorry that we didn't have more time to take your questions, but I encourage you uh, uh, to reach out to our panelists. I, I hope they don't <laughs> hope they don't get mad at me for saying that, but <laughs> if you have any questions, perhaps they may be willing to respond to them over email. Um, this recording will be available on YouTube uh, to follow up and to watch later and perhaps share with your colleagues who are working on these issues. We'll also be sharing the, uh, the, the, all the presentations 
and the URL link to the report with all of the registered participants who are on the call. So thanks thanks so much for joining, for following our work, for 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 being interested in this topic. And um, we'll we'll hopefully see you again soon and either in a conversation about noise or about many of the other things that we have to tackle. Thanks so much, everyone, and have a good rest of the day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Joe. Joe. Thank you. Well, well done, considering you had COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you.